Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for uh, coming over here to ISTC for our final seminar for this semester. My name is Nancy Holm, which many of you may know me, and then I'm a director here at ISTC, and I'm the seminar organizer along with Beth Mischewski. Uh This seminar, um, as with our other ones, we're going to be archiving that on our website, so if you would like to watch it later or tell colleagues about it, that should be available. We've had a little delay in posting those this spring, but we hope to get those posted soon so you can check back on our website. Um, as we begin today's seminar, I'd like to ask everyone to please silence your cell phone for those here in our audience. And then I also wanted to mention that we're going to hold all the questions till the end for the speaker, and then I'll come around with the microphone so we can record that for our archived version. Uh, for those listening online, uh, we'll also take your questions at the end, and you can type those in though at any time, and then we'll read those and ask our speaker to answer those at the end also. So I'm very pleased today to have as our guest speaker Dr. Alistair Boxall. Dr. Boxall is a professor in environmental science at the University of York in the UK. Uh, Dr. Boxall's uh, research uh, focuses on understanding emerging and future ecological and health risks posed by chemical contaminants in the natural environment. Uh, he is a member of the DEFRA Advisory Hazardous Substances Advisory Committee and he's chair of the Pharmaceutical Advisory Group of the Society of Environmental Toxicology and Chemistry. He regularly advises national and international organizations on issues related to chemical inputs on the environment and has published extensively on the topic of emerging contaminants, which include pharmaceuticals, nanomaterials, and veterinary medicines. And then Elster is also a co-coordinator of the 3.5 million euro project uh, capacity, uh, which is exploring methods for monitoring pollution in cities. He received his PhD from the University of Sheffield. Uh, today he's going to give a talk on his work on pharmaceuticals in the environment. So I'm very pleased to welcome from the UK, Dr. Boxall. Thanks, Nancy. Um, I must update my website because um, I'm no longer a member of the as the Substances Advisory Committee, and I'm no longer chair of the CTAC Pharmaceuticals Advisory Group. And that's happened to before, and I should really, really update the, uh, the website. So it's great to be here, uh, and I'd like to thank uh, Nancy for, for sort of organizing my visit. Um, I'm here as part of a, a group, a small group from, from York, um, and what we're trying to do is visit um, sort of Urbana Champaign uh, and sort of discuss the sort of potential for collaboration between York uh, and, and some scientists here. So um, hopefully I can give you an overview uh, of, of my research interests, what we're doing at York, uh, and hopefully it might sort of spark some interest from your side and it might lead to some collaboration uh, in the future. Um, so what I'm going to do then is I'm going to talk about um, the work that we've been doing over the last 15 years or so uh, on pharmaceutical risks. Um, and I'm going to talk you through um, some of the work we've been doing on, on occurrence of pharmaceuticals uh, in the environment, um, some of the work that we've been doing on effects of pharmaceuticals in the environment, uh, and then try and make some, some, some analysis of what that means uh, in terms of risks to the environment. And then towards the end, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, management um, techniques. And it's really interesting coming here that you're working a lot uh, on how we sort of manage issues around pharmaceuticals in the environment. Uh, I think this is an area that's going to grow, so I'll sort of talk about sort of where we're heading uh, with that. Um, so I think it's probably... We all, we all know that at some stage in our lives, we will probably use uh, pharmaceuticals. Um, and if you go to many people's bathrooms um, and look in the cabinet in the bathroom, usually you'll see something like this. Um, so here we've got a mixture uh, of pharmaceuticals uh, and personal care products. Um, so we as society are using these, these uh, substances uh, continuously. Uh, and when we use them, um, we'll absorb them into our body. Uh, they will probably have some form of therapeutic effect. Uh, we might metabolize them, but ultimately what we'll do is we will excrete them. So we'll excrete them uh, either as the unchanged molecule or as transformation products. Uh, certainly where I live, uh, what will happen is those materials will then be transported to the wastewater network. Uh, and this is quite a nice picture uh, of a sewer in London. So this is one of the old Victorian sewers in London, which looks quite moody. 
uh, but probably doesn't smell quite as nice as it looks. Um, that material then will be transported to a waste water treatment works. Um, and in the UK, uh, we treat our wastewater in two ways. So generally, uh, the bigger cities will have activated sludge treatment. So um, something like this. This isn't actually in the UK. This is actually in the Canary Islands. Um, but yeah, so the big cities will use activated sludge treatment. There may be tertiary treatments. Um, and ultimately, that then could get into the environment. In smaller areas, we tend to use trickling filters, and I'll come back to trickling filters later. But the effluent from those sort of wastewater treatment processes then uh, will ultimately enter the aquatic environment, um, something like this, which is a picture uh, of the main river in Adelaide in Australia. Um, so thinking about the fact that we use pharmaceuticals um, and we're emitting them into the wastewater treatment process, those wastewater treatment systems aren't really designed to remove pharmaceuticals. What we'd expect then is that we'll probably find these things in surface waters. Uh, and about 16, 17 years ago, people began to think about this. Uh, and in the late 90s, uh, we were just talking about Thomas Turnus. Thomas Turnus in Germany uh, started a, quite a big study in Germany looking at concentrations of pharmaceuticals in the Rhine River. Uh, and they went out into the Rhine River they did the monitoring and they found these compounds. In the US, in 2002, um, the US Geological Survey also did some monitoring. That was a much bigger project. That was across the whole of the US. And so Dana Colpin and his colleagues went and took lots of samples. They analyzed them for a range of pharmaceuticals uh, and they detected the pharmaceuticals. Now in the UK, um, we've also done some of that and I'll also talk a little bit about that later. So these things occur in the environment. So Early in the 2000s, people sort of began to say, well, these things occur in the environment. What are the effects? Um, and the main concern was that the molecules are biologically active. So if we take a pharmaceutical, um, the idea is it will come into our body. Uh, it will probably interact with some receptor or biochemical pathway. Uh, and in that interaction, then, it will cause some form of therapeutic effect. Now, the problem is many of the receptors that occur in us also occur in organisms in the environment. So if these things are released into the environment, they accumulate into, say, a fish, and that fish has the receptor, then there's a possibility that you're going to get some type of effect uh, on the fish or other organism. And a whole range of studies have been done looking at that uh, and to look at the potential effects of these molecules. I'll just quickly go through some of them. Um, so this one um, is actually a US study. Um, again, I think I so Nancy was saying that Rebecca actually visited here uh, last month uh, and talked about um, some of the work that she's doing. So Re Rebecca's uh, based up north uh, in the Great Lakes Water Institute. And some of Rebecca's very early work was looking at a molecule called fluoxetine. Uh, so fluoxetine is an antidepressant. It's a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, and it's the active ingredient in Prozac. Um, which I guess most people would have heard of. Now, in this study then, what they did was they exposed fish to 100 nanograms per liter of fluoxetine. So in the environment, we will tend to detect a few nanograms per liter of, of fluoxetine. So it's not too much higher than what you'd see uh, in a river in the UK. The way these studies worked is they would have a tank. They had two fish in the tank, a male fish and a female fish. Uh, there were these tiles in the tank, which acted as a fish nest. And what they did is they observed the behavior of the fish. So they treated the fish, and they also had tanks with non-treated fish, so no fluoxetine, uh, and they compared those two treatments. And this is what they found. So they found that the fluoxetine affected the behavior uh, of the fish in the exposure. So the males sat under the tiles much longer than the control males. Uh, they didn't chase the females as much as the control males. And what that meant then is the time that the fish spent on breeding was much, much lower than in the control tank. Now, if you move that into the real environment, if that happens in the real environment, that could have quite significant implications in survival of the population. We've also done some stuff on fluoxetine, and, and I'll talk about some of the other stuff we've done on fluoxetine later. Um, and this is actually looking at the terrestrial environment. This was an undergraduate project where what we wanted to do was look at whether fluoxetine affected the, the uh, behavior of wood lice. So I think you have wood lice in, in the US. So this, these are the things that live on the rocks. 
Um, and you know, if, if you pick up a rock and there's wood lice under the rock, the first thing they do is they run away. So what we wanted to look at is whether exposure to fluoxetine affected that response or not. So we developed an experiment where we exposed the uh, wood lice to quite low concentrations of fluoxetine. Uh, we then would uh, sort of in, input a light stimulus, so we'd turn the light on, and we'd film how quickly uh, the wood lice ran for a refuge. Uh, and what we found is actually we got a significant difference between the control treatment, so this is the response time in seconds here, uh, and the Prozac treated wood lice. So there does seem to be effects of the wood lice on the behavior uh, of, of the fluoxetine, sorry, on the behavior of the wood lice. Now both of those examples are effects that you could probably sort of relate to the therapeutic mode of action uh, of the drug. Now some drugs will also cause side effects in the environment. Uh, probably the best uh, example of that is the diclofenac story. Um, so if you're not familiar with this story, what happened was in certain areas of India and Pakistan, over a period of about 20 years, they saw a massive decline in the number of birds, species, so number of vultures uh, in those regions. So this is a quote from um, Vibhu Prakash from the Bombay Natural History Society. And what he said was that in the early 1980s, there were 40 million birds in those regions. As you move into the late 1990s, those numbers have dropped to 60,000. So a massive decline in the numbers of vultures. At that time, a lot of environmental forensics was done to try and find out what was causing it. So they considered things like pesticide exposure, climate change. But at the end of the day, they concluded that that decline was down to exposure to a drug, a molecule called diclofenac, which is a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug. And what was happening is the farmers in the region were using diclofenac to treat their cattle. When the cattle were dying, the vultures were coming in, they were eating the carcass, getting a dose of the diclofenac. And due to differences between the metabolism of the drug in the human and the vulture, they turned out to be really sensitive. And over time, it started killing off the populations. Uh, and if you look at the literature, they suggest that it's probably one of the fastest declines in the bird population ever seen. Uh, in history, so a significant effect. Now what I want to focus on today then um, is the UK situation uh, and work we've been doing in the UK. So I'm going to ask these questions. So I'm going to so look at what the level of exposure is uh, across the landscape. I'm going to then ask the question, could there be impacts? And then the final thing I want to talk about is if we do see impacts in the UK environment, what could we do to begin to manage those impacts? So as I said earlier, we have done some monitoring in the UK, and if you go to the literature, there are a number of studies that look at the occurrence of pharmaceuticals uh, in the UK. Now this is a study that we did about five years ago. Um, it was quite an intensive study where we chose four catchments in the UK. Um, I can't tell you the names of the rivers because uh, I'm sworn to secrecy, but these are the regions where the, the so catchments are based. Uh, one of those, you can see he has quite a big population and quite a number of wastewater treatment works, so I imagine you can guess which river that is. Um, uh, and you can see that as wastewater treatment works, there's lots of different types of wastewater treatment works on, on the River Thames. Um, and these are the uh, sort of average residence times of the water uh, at the sam point of sampling uh, for, for each of those wastewater treatment works. Now what we did is we monitored a range of pharmaceuticals uh, and illicit drugs at those sites uh, and we did it every month and we looked at the surface water and at those sites there's also a drinking water abstraction point so we also looked at the drinking water. These are the drugs we looked at, so it's a mixture of molecules, um, so very quickly going through them, uh, carbamazepine is an anti-epileptic treatment, uh, simvastatin uh, is a lipid regulator, uh, we have uh, an antibiotic here, uh, so we have some non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, so naproxen, ketoprofen, ibuprofen, and diclofenac that we just mentioned. Uh, we have fluoxetine that we just mentioned. Uh, cyclophosphamide is a cancer treatment. Um, furosemide, a diuretic. Uh, Orlistat was quite an interesting one because as we started the study, um, Orlistat is an anti-obesity drug. And just before we started the monitoring, uh, it was made available over the counter. So uh, at that point, people could go into the pharmacist and they could just buy it over the counter.
about prescription. We thought that what we might see is suddenly that the levels of this thing would, would shoot up uh, because it had just been approved. Actually, we didn't detect it, but uh, that's why we looked at it. Um, you can see that we also have some uh, illicit drugs. So we have cocaine here, uh, and we also looked at this molecule here, which is the metabolite of cocaine, uh, and there are also a couple of metabolites, the other active pharmaceutical ingredients. So uh, this is the carbamazepine metabolite, and then norfluoxetine uh, is the fluoxetine metabolite. Now, I won't bore you to death with all of the data, um, but the main message that I can sort of say is that we did detect these things. Um, these are some of the summary data. So what we have here is the mean concentrations across the year uh, for the different drugs. Um, so these are just some of the drugs we looked at. Uh, and then these are the concentrations that we see in each of the catchments. Uh, and what we find is that when we detect these things, generally the types of concentrations that we'll see will be the low nanogram per liter levels up to a, perhaps a few hundred nanograms per liter. Uh, and that's quite typical. And if you look at the literature in other countries, you'll find a similar type of value. And I suspect you see the same uh, in the studies that you're doing here. At the moment, we're, we're doing some more work on monitoring. So we have quite an intensive study uh, at the moment in York looking at occurrence over time. Uh, and what we're trying to do here is develop a picture of how pharmaceutical exposure so it varies over the city. Uh, I'll just show you some of the preliminary data from that study. Um, but this is a map of York. So York has a population of about 200,000 people. Uh, we have two rivers going through the city. So we have the River Foss, which uh, goes down here through the city. And then we have the River Ouse, which goes down here. Now, the River Ouse is the biggest river. And then the Foss is quite a small river. The two rivers then join. They go down to the south of the city, come out the bottom, uh, and then there's wastewater treatment works emitting into the rivers. So you have a trickling filter up here emitting into the foss, an activated sludge plant here emitting into the ooze, and then an activated sludge plant here to the south of the city. We also have a drinking water abstraction point. So there's a drinking water abstraction point here, uh, and then the treatment works is here, and then that's distributing water uh, to the population of the city. And what we're doing is we're monitoring uh, that system. So we have samples upstream of the wastewater treatment works. We have samples moving down from the wastewater treatment works as you move through the city. Uh, and we're doing sampling uh, every month. We're also doing diurnal sampling to look at exposure concentrations over time during the day to try and get, really get an understanding of how the levels of a whole range of compounds vary uh, in the city. And what we're trying to do is link that to usage and also the properties of metabolism of the drugs. But this is just some of the early data. Um, so what we have here are the different sampling points we did in our pilot study. Um, so we take samples from each of these points. Uh, so we have 10 sites. We looked at 88 compounds using, using the US Geological Survey. One of our graduate students came over to the US. They worked with Dana Colpin and his colleagues, um, so Ed Furlong's group, uh, to sort of learn the analyses. They worked on the USGS method. Uh, and then we monitored both the surface water and the drinking water. Now, these data here are actually from metformin. So we're just talking about metformin. So metformin um, is uh, a diabetic treatment. It's a treatment for uh, type 2 diabetes. Um, and you can see that we actually, compared to the earlier data that I showed you, we actually see very, very high concentrations uh, of the metformin. So we have concentrations almost up to about a microgram per liter. Uh, so over a microgram per liter here. Um, so we are seeing quite high concentrations of the metformin. Um, and because diabetes is becoming a real problem in the UK, uh, we expect that those levels will go up over time as you know, we use more and more of the drug. Now, one of the really interesting things is, um, is that we also detect quite high concentrations in the drinking water. So usually we don't see much of these things in the drinking water, but actually when we sampled the tap water in the city. Um, we had two samples in this pilot study. You can see that we're seeing concentrations of about 250 and 280 nanograms per liter uh, in that drinking water. So there isn't a lot of removal uh, of the metformin in the drinking water treatment process, uh, which I think involves coagulation and flocculation, ozonation, and GAC. Um, so it seems that a lot of that material is just passing through. Um, so it's river water is the source water. So what happens is you've got the drinking water uh, treatment plant about here. It's extracting from the river. So the 
the attraction point's not that far downstream uh, of the wastewater uh, uh, effluent emission. Um, so this just summarizes those results. Uh, as I say, over the next uh, few months, uh, we'll be getting a lot more data. So we're, we're about halfway through the monitoring campaign now. Um, so we have 36 pharmaceuticals detected in the pilot study and quantifiable. 20 pharmaceuticals were detected, but were below the LOQ. Uh, 26 pharmaceuticals weren't detected. And in the drinking water, we detected metformin, nicotine, probably not due to pharmaceutical usage, but we did detect it, uh, acetaminophen, carbamazepine, cotinine, and triamterine. So that was the monitoring. Now, as I said at the sort of a, a few slides ago, what we're trying to do is try and get an idea of what exposure is across uh, the UK landscape. Uh, and what we've been doing here is we've been using our monitoring data alongside exposure models to try and model the UK system. Uh, and the way the exposure models that we use sort of typically work is what we'll have um, is a scenario. So you've got, say, a town like York. You have the population of York. We know the usage data, so we can get usage data in the UK. We're quite lucky because we have the National Health Service. They collect that data, and it's available uh, to people like you know, anyone, basically. A public can go to the, the NHS website and then download the usage data. So we can get the usage in milligrams per person per day as an average for the city. Um, we can get information, obviously, on the metabolism from the uh, sort of material from the drug, drug safety data. Um, we know the population size of the city. So if we know this, we can know how much is going to be emitted to the wastewater treatment plants. We have information on removal in wastewater treatment plants that we can then estimate how much is removed. That will tell us how much goes into the river. Uh, we can get information on dissipation processes in the river. And using all of that information, then, we can begin to model uh, what the concentrations are uh, in, in a particular situation. Now, the models that we're working with are actually spatial models. Um, so we work with the Centre for Ecology and Hydrology uh, in the UK, who have a spatial model for England and Wales called Low Flows 2000. And the way you, Low Flows 2000 works um, is so schematically shown here. So here we have a catchment. We have a number of towns on that catchment with wastewater treatment works. Uh, and using the so spatial model, we can begin to build up a picture what the exposure is in the river systems within that catchment. Uh, and we've applied this approach to the pharmaceuticals. I won't go into detail of exactly how we did it, uh, but if you're interested, I can point you in the direction of the paper, which will tell you uh, the process that we used. Now, out of that model, then, what we can do is we can then develop um, data on the landscape uh, levels or levels of the pharmaceuticals across the landscape for England and Wales. So uh, here we have England and Wales, um, these are the catchments that we modeled. So we looked at, I think it was 22 catchments uh, across the two countries. Um, they were receiving um, sort of emissions from 22 million people. So about a third of a million, uh, about a third of the population uh, of the UK. Um, and it corresponded, I think, to about 3,200 river reaches. So for every, every river reach, we had a concentration of pharmaceutical. Um, and this is just one of those uh, pharmaceuticals. This is trimethoprim, which is an antibiotic. Um, so the colors correspond to the concentrations that we're predicting across that landscape. Now, what we can do then is we can take that data and we can get distributions of exposure. So we can take the data for each of the river reaches, the 3,200 river reaches, and we can plot them as, a, as an exposure distribution. Now, what we've been doing is we've been doing that modeling, but we wanted to check whether the modeling has worked. So um, we've got data as well from real monitoring studies. Um, so we've, we've sort of taken some studies that have been done looking at occurrence of these drugs uh, across the UK, and then we compared the distributions. Um, and this is how we do it. So um, what we have here is we have the model distribution. Then I've overlaid the distribution uh, based on the monitoring data. And you can see that in this particular example, there's very, very good agreement between the model distribution and the monitored distribution, giving us confidence in, in our exposure modeling. Uh, and again, I won't go into all of the others, but um, trust me, it works well for all of the others. Um, and it does seem to work really well in terms of getting exposure distributions for the catchments that we're, we're modeling. So we therefore so trust uh, our model predictions. 
So, as I say, that was 22 large catchments, served a population of 21 million, 3,117 river reaches. Uh, and what we then did is we wanted to ask the question, well, we've got our exposure distributions. What does that mean in terms of risk? So the way we did that was we compared our exposure predictions to effects endpoints. Uh, and we did that for both ecotoxicological endpoints, uh, but we also did a similar thing for human health endpoints due to exposure to drinking water. So the way we do the comparison then is we have our exposure distribution, our 3,117 river reaches. For each of those river reaches, we then calculate the risk characterization ratio. So this is the RCR, where we take the concentration in the river reach, we derive it, uh, we divide that by the predicted no effect concentration, which we obtain from available ecotoxicity data. Um, and also in, the, EU, uh, in, in EU, the EU, we have, at the moment, discussions about introducing environmental quality standards for these compounds. So uh, rather than dividing by the PNEC, we've also, in some cases, where an EQS is being proposed, we've used the EQS. And then what you can do is you can get a distribution of those risk characterization ratios. Uh, expressed here as a box and whisker plot. So um, this is the minimum RCR, the maximum, the upper and lower quartiles, and then the median. And these are the data that we get for all of the, mo uh, the molecules that we modeled. So you have the different pharmaceuticals on the x-axis, the risk characterization ratio on the y-axis. This is a log scale. The red line corresponds to a risk characterization of ratio of 1. So that's the value that we, you'd worry about. So if you have values greater than one, then you would say that the risk is not acceptable. Uh, you can see that for most of the drugs, actually, we're, we're quite a lot lower than one. So uh, if you take trimethoprim, the concentrations of trimethoprim are probably you know, two or three orders of magnitude lower than that value of one, indicating that the risk is probably not that great. But we do have some instances where we're above that line. Uh, and probably the most clear one here is ibuprofen. We're almost about 50% of that box and whisker plot is above that risk characterization that ratio trigger uh, of one. Uh, diclofenac, so here we have diclofenac over here. Diclofenac is one of the molecules where uh, an environmental quality standard is being proposed. If that quality standard comes into effect, then what we would predict is that this part of the whisker would be above that quality standard. So that's just a few percent of the river reaches would exceed that quality standard. Okay, so that's the ecotoxicological effects. Now we also have used data uh, uh, and modeling data to look at human health effects. Um, and this is something that's sort of got into the public interest in the UK. Uh, so this was uh, a headline article back in 2008 in The Independent. The Independent is one of the better national newspapers in the UK. Uh, and what it talked about, so this was actually on the front page of The, of the Independent, and what it talked about was tests for drugs in tap water. Uh, and if you look carefully at it, what it's, what it's saying is that there are concerns about pharmaceuticals in the environment getting into drinking water and potentially causing effects on human health. So for here it says powerful anti whoops. Powerful anti cancer drugs are a particular concern as they can be excreted unaltered from the body into the sewage system. They're thought to be potentially dangerous because they're highly toxic to dividing cells, are easily dissolved in water, and difficult to destroy by conventional water treatment techniques. As I say, this was on the front page of the Independent. And we had an article last year in The Guardian which was similar which again, I don't think it's quite on the, on the front page, but it was a whole page article on pharmaceuticals in drinking water. So this is something that's getting into the popular press, and it's something that the public are aware of. So we've been working with our modeling uh, to try and ask the question, well, thinking about that, is actually there any evidence that these things could be causing uh, risks to human health? So we've been modeling 100 drinking water plants, uh, in the modeled river network where we have the uh, exposure concentrations in surface water. Uh, so we got the predictions for the point of abstraction. We combine that with drinking water treatment rates to get an idea of how much is going to be removed from the treatment process and then what the concentration is going to be in the finished drinking water. And then we assume that an individual will drink two liters of water per day and then we compare that exposure with an ex acceptable daily intake. 
uh, and then we get box and whisker plots uh, for that assessment. So same as for the ecotoxicity one, what we have here is the different drugs on the x-axis, the risk characterization ratio here. Uh, if you had a value greater than one, then the concentration that you're predicting would be greater than the acceptable daily intake. Uh, and what you can see is actually for the drugs we modeled, the box and whiskers are quite a lot lower than one. Uh, and what we're, we're, we're sort of beginning to, to see is that probably you'd need to drink, this is just the second set of compounds, probably what you need to do is drink, sort of, I think it's 480 years worth of water to get a daily dose or accepted daily dose of a cytotoxic drug. So these concentrations are very, very low. So what we, what we think is actually, is I don't think we should forget about it. I don't think we should ignore it. But in terms of risks compared to other things we're being exposed to, exposure of pharmaceuticals in, in drinking water, certainly in countries like the UK, are probably not sort of one of the top priorities. Um, it could be an issue in other countries. So you've got other countries where you don't have the wastewater treatment processes that we have in the UK, and you don't have the drinking water treatment processes in, that we have in the UK, then the exposure could be very different, and these values could, should be very different. But compared to ecotoxicity, we don't think it's as high a priority as effects on organisms in the environment. So that's the sort of human health endpoint. Now, very quickly, I just want to sort of talk about some work that we've been doing more recently, thinking about wildlife. So a lot of, if you go to the literature, most of the focus in terms of ecological effects has been on fish, uh, invertebrates, and a little bit on algae. We've really ignored the sort of furry wildlife and the stuff with feathers, so things like birds, bats, uh, and sort of mice, and, and you know, the, the sort of the wildlife species. Um, and we think this is, a, this is a group that really we should be looking at. Uh, I mentioned earlier that in the UK, a lot of the rural towns use trickling filters. So this is a, a picture of a trickling filter. Uh, and the way the trickling filter works, I think you have these in the, in, in the US, uh, but if you're not familiar with them, uh, the way they work is you have a gravel bed. On that gravel bed, you have a biofilm. And then what happens is the wastewater is spread onto the biofilm, onto the bed, uh, and you get the degradation of the sewage that will then percolate through the, through the filter uh, and come out the other end a, a lot cleaner than when it came in. Now, if you've ever been to these sites, uh, particularly on a sun summer's day, uh, you'll know that there's quite a lot of flies present. So there'll be lots of insects flying about because it's a nice environment for them to live. Uh, and if you've ever, I, I, I doubt whether many of you, you have done it, but if you ever walked across one of these with a spade and started digging, you would find lots of earthworms. Um, they're packed with earthworms. Uh, so this is just a picture. So I, I did actually do it in Australia. Uh, we went. We went out to the wastewater treatment works um, with this big Aussie. Uh, he took me, stopped the boom uh, going around in a circle. Uh, he took a, a, a sort of spade out, and we walked into the middle of the filter to collect earthworms. We had no gloves, uh, and he started digging and picking these earthworms. And he looked at me, and he said, aren't you going to help? And I then had to get on my hands and knees and join him picking earthworms uh, with no gloves on. So don't tell my health and safety officer back in New York. Um, but I did clean my hands very, very thoroughly afterwards. Um, but we, we were looking at the uptake of pharmaceuticals into those earthworms. Because you think you've got the pharmaceuticals going into the tricking filter, you've got all of these invertebrates in the tricking filter, and it's inevitable that you're going to get uptake uh, into the invertebrates. So those invertebrates then are a great food source for wildlife. Uh, and this is that site in Australia uh, and you can look closely, this is the boom, and it's covered in birds. And those birds are feeding off the earthworms, and they're feeding off the flies. So what we've been looking at then is firstly looking at the movement of the drugs into the invertebrates, so whether they're taken up by earthworms. And more recently, we've been looking at if those earthworms then get eaten on by a bird, what the effect on the bird might be. Um, so these are some of the studies we've been doing with uh, earthworms, so we've been looking at effects of soil properties, also whether you get differences between earthworm species. Uh, and then the bird work, we focused on starlings, and we did a study again with fluoxetine, where we exposed the birds over 22 weeks to fluoxetine in, in worms at the concentration that we think will occur in a worm at one of these works. And then we did experiments looking at the distribution of the fluoxetine in the birds, 
And we also did behavioral and physiological studies uh, on the birds. So this is how we do the earthworm studies then. So what we do is you expose the earthworms to your matrix. We look at the uptake of the phylloxetine. Uh, I think this is phylloxetine over time. Uh, you can see that it's taken up. And we're also interested in whether the worms can decorate it. Um, so this is the, the worms are then moved to a, a clean environment where you can look at the depuration uh, of the drug. And from that data, then, you can get kinetic data. So you can get an uptake rate constant, and you can get a depuration rate constant. And using those constants, you can derive bioconcentration factors. So what we've been looking at is whether you get different bioconcentration behavior in different environments. So this is actually looking at the effects of soil types. So we have a range of soil types, different pHs, different organic carbon contents. And then these are the bioconcentration factors for one earthworm species. Uh, and then this is a second earthworm species looking at the effect of the species type uh, on the uptake of the drugs. Uh, and this shows that you do get accumulation of these, some of these drugs into the worms. So as I said, we then focused on fluoxetine. We put fluoxetine into worms. We fed the worms to the bird, uh, exposed them for 22 weeks. And then we looked at the distribution of the fluoxetine in the, in the bird. So this is the data from that study. So what we have is the concentration in the earthworm is about 26 nanograms per gram. So that's what we're estimating would occur in a, in a real uh, trickling filter. Um, that gives a, an intake of about 620 nanograms of fluoxetine per bird per day. That's based on the feeding rate of the bird. And then the real data, so this is actually looking at the analysis of the different tissues. Uh, we see some fluoxetine in the brain of the bird. Uh, we see some in the muscle, quite a lot in the liver, uh, and a little bit in the kidney. Um, and what we're, we're interested in now is looking at how this data compares to what would happen in us. So we're trying to compare how the distribution and metabolism of the drug relates to what would happen uh, in us as a human. And as I said, we also looked at the effects actually on the behavior of the birds and the physiology of the birds. We did lots and lots of studies uh, looking at lots and lots of endpoints. Most of them weren't affected at all. So we had a control treatment and a fluoxetine treatment. But what we did find is we did see evidence that the fluoxetine exposure might be affecting the foraging behavior of the birds. So we found that um, it affected the timing that the birds were feeding during the day. Uh, so I think uh, here we have the control treatments. We have after, time after sunrise here. The blue is the control treatment, and then the uh, red is the fluoxetine treatment. So you can see that the fluoxetine birds seem to be so starting to feed at the later stage than the um, non-fluoxetine treated birds. We also saw some physiological effects. Now, a colleague is now sort of taking this work forward. So we're not totally sure whether this data um, is sort of something we should worry about or not. So she's got a PhD student where she's doing further studies on fluoxetine, looking at these endpoints to see whether they're real or not. So just to sum all that up then, so in terms of risk, what we're predicting from the data that we're bringing together um, is that there probably are a handful of pharmaceuticals that could be having impacts in the environment. Um, so if we take ibuprofen, for example, in terms of the rivers across England and Wales, we estimate that probably about 45% of those rivers could have concentrations of fluoxetine that could be a concern. Uh, and the end point that that's based on is fish hatching. Um, so it could be that hydroprofen exposure could be affecting you know, the, the survival of fish populations uh, in the UK. The diclofenac, just under 5% of river reaches, we think would be above the environmental quality standard. That EQS has been developed based on histological data. So that's data on the histology uh, in, in the livers and kidneys. Um, so possibly you'd, you'd expect that about 5% of rivers, you're going to get effects on fish histology. So that's about 150 river reaches. Um, we think that the risks of direct exposure to human health is low. Um, the indirect effects are possible. And I, I won't talk about that today, but antibiotic resistance might be something we need to think about. And there is potential effects on wildlife. And I think the work with fluoxetine is suggesting that this is something we need to look at in more detail. But that then begs the question, well, if we see all of these potential risks, 
what can be done to control those risks. And this is something that we've now started to think about, uh, and I think it's really nice to see that you're doing a lot of work in this, this area, uh, and it may be somewhere something where we can begin to work together. Now, I think probably what we need is we need to use a combination of approaches, and these are just some of them. Um, so we could think about developing more environmentally friendly molecules, so what we call benign by design. So if you've got a drug that you're worried about, perhaps we could either replace it with something that's less environmentally toxic or something that degrades more quickly. Uh, we could upgrade wastewater treatment plants. So in the UK, if those environmental quality standards come in, uh, there's, there's a number of molecules they've been proposed for. So diclofenac is one, ethanol is stradal is the other. Um, so that's the active ingredient in the contraceptive pill. Uh, and what we're predicting is for EE2, quite a lot of the river reaches would exceed that uh, EQS. And there's a paper in Nature a couple of years ago that estimated that if, if the EQS comes into force, what will have to happen is water companies will have to upgrade their wastewater treatment works. And they're, they're likely to put in GAC as a treatment, as a tertiary treatment. Now, the cost of that, they estimate, will be 28 billion euros, um, which I guess is about 35 billion US dollars uh, over a period of about 10 years. So it's a lot of money, and that's just in the UK. Now that EQS is going to operate across Europe, so if you scale that up to Europe, we're talking a lot of money to treat out the EE2. We could think about stewardship schemes, so perhaps having uh, take-back schemes for, for farm, to, to take your unused drugs back to the pharmacists. And it's really good to see that you're doing work here to so try and promote that. Uh, and then alongside that, what I want to very quickly talk about um, is thinking about in situ treatment that could be used alongside these stewardship schemes. And very quickly, I just want to introduce you some work we've been doing on a, on a system called PyroPure. So I've just got a video that I'll quickly show you that tells you uh, how PyroPure works. So that's PyroPure, um, and the idea of PyroPure is that it's a in situ treatment um, for treating waste. Um, and we were contacted by PyroPure about a year and a half ago because that one area that they were interested in is whether the system could be used for treating waste pharmaceuticals. Uh, and the idea would be that a pharmacist or a clinic would have one of these systems on site. So as the public take back their used medicines, the pharmacist could be loading them into the pyropyl treatment and they could treat them on site. And the advantage of that is, is it would avoid the cost of hazardous waste disposal. So the pharmacists in the UK have to pay quite a lot of money to waste disposal companies to get rid of the hazardous waste. It would also have environmental benefits because if you look at the distribution of hazardous waste incinerators in the UK uh, compared to where everyone lives in the UK, there are certain areas of the UK where you've got perhaps 100, 150 miles away, your nearest incinerator. So you've got the CO2 emissions from the transport. You've also got security issues. So if you've got controlled drugs, 
Uh, but then you've got potential security issues in terms of transporting those around the, the country. So what they thought is that actually Pyropure might be quite a nice system that you could use in situ to dispose and treat of the drugs. So what they wanted to do was actually prove that it worked. And the way we, we approached this is we look, looked at the top 300 drugs, no, actually it's the top 600 drugs used in the UK, and we pulled out information on the thermal stability of those drugs. Um, so this is just a distribution of that data. Um, so you can see that some of the drugs are not particularly thermally stable. Then you have drugs up here where decomposition temperatures are up at a, a few hundred degrees C. What we did was we then selected molecules towards the upper end of that graph. So these red points are the molecules we selected. We also selected some of the molecules so down here where uh, the EQSs were being proposed. So EQSs have also been proposed or talked about for, F, for estradiol and also, also for car carbonazepine. So we threw those into the pot. So these are the drugs we looked at. Again, it's a mixture of molecules. So these are some of the more firmly resistant drugs. Uh, and what we did is we fed them into the pyrofuel system in different waste forms. So we had a simulation where we looked at the tape back medicine uh, type scenario. So here you have your tape back bins. They were put into the system. Uh, contaminated sharps, this might be somewhere like a clinic or a hospital where you've got the sharps. You add those to the system. Uh, and we also looked at manufacturing waste. So the factories in the UK, um, they, they're using uh, disposable overalls for their workers. So if they were out in the factory, they've got the overalls. Those have to be disposed of as hazardous waste. Uh, the blue rolls that are used for cleaning equipment, that has to be disposed of as hazardous waste. So we had uh, bags that were filled with overalls and, and blue roll where we added the pharmaceuticals and we put them into the system. We then ran them. So we had three machines operating alongside each other. We ran them. We collected all the emissions, so we looked at the air emissions, we looked at the effluent emissions, we also looked at the char, uh, and then we analyzed the, the pharmaceuticals to look at the removal. So the analysis was done using uh, LCMS-MS, so that was uh, a triple quad, uh, and we also looked at the transformation products using FTMS. So these are just some of the data. So what we have here is the different drugs. We have the percent here, the blue bar, are uh, uh, sort of what was added that's destroyed. And then the red corresponds to the sort of mass balance sort of going into the different emissions. So you can see for this particular simulation, actually we, for most of the compounds, we're getting quite good de degradation. So we're getting over uh, 99, 99.5% removal of the active substances. Um, here, you can see that for a few of them, we are seeing them in the uh, emissions. Now, actually, this is a bit deceptive because this is actually down to detection limits. So where something was below the LOD, um, we, we, we took the LOD as the value that we used in the mass balance. Um, so what we did for those molecules, we redid the study, we improved our analytical methods, so we brought down the LODs, and then we reran it, uh, and this is what we found. So the key thing to recognize in this graph is actually that the y-axis goes from 99% to 100%, but you can see that actually for those molecules, we're actually getting you know, more than 99.8% removal of, of the molecules by the pyropure system. So overall, what we're finding is pyropure will remove about 99% or you know, destroy about 99% of the pharmaceuticals. In terms of the degradation products, we don't see any of the known degradation products uh, being formed in the process. This is something we want to do a little bit more work on to see whether you know, there might be some byproducts that could be being produced that we might want to worry about. But the evidence at the moment looks very promising. So just to finish then, um, hopefully that sort of demonstrates that over the last sort of 15, 16 years, there has been a massive increase over the concerns about uh, pharmaceuticals in the environment. And we do detect them around the world, uh, and there is evidence that they could be causing effects. I think by using a combination of modeling, monitoring, alongside laboratory studies, we can begin to get a much better idea of what the impacts of these things are on the environment. Using these types of approaches then, in the UK, we predict that for some molecules, quite a large proportion of the river reaches are at risk. We also think that possibly wildlife is also at risk from exposure. So I think what we do need to begin to move towards is better management. And I think we need a number of approaches used in tandem 
to manage the, the concentration of pharmaceuticals in the environment. But there are still many open questions, and very quickly, I just want to talk about a new project, what's well, going, been going for a year now, that we're, we're working on in Europe um, called IPI. Uh, and IPI is designed to answer many of these sort of research questions around pharmaceuticals in the environment. So it's an IMI project. So IMI is the Innovative Medicines Initiative. It's a public-private research partnership. So it's uh, supported by the European Commission and the pharmaceutical industry. It's worth 10.3 million euros. So I guess that's about 13 million dollars. Uh, it's a four-year project. Started January 2015, and it involves 25 partners from industry, academia, research institutes, and regulators. And 13 of those partners are companies. We have people like Pfizer, Alanco, Merck, Eli Lilly, uh, all the big pharmaceutical companies are participating in the project. I'm the academic coordinator, um, but what the overall aim is, is to develop frameworks and tools that we can use to much better assess what the risks of pharmaceuticals are in the environment, to identify those handful of pharmaceuticals that could be causing impacts in the environment. And the really good thing about this project, I think, is the industry engagement. So they're bringing their data and knowledge to the table. And what we're doing is we're developing a database, which will have the ecotoxicity data, the environmental fate data, the mammalian toxicity data, that that can then be used for data mining and model development for use in much more intelligent testing uh, of pharmaceuticals. The aim is, ultimately, to develop a software tool. Uh, and the intention is that that software tool will be available, so it will be available to researchers to use in their, in their work. So in three years' time, that should be available to everyone. Uh, the database will be available. There is discussion about which data will be available. So some companies seem to be, to be very transparent, so their, their data will probably be available to people like yourselves if you're interested. Other companies a little bit more secretive so that data won't be available, that will be hidden in the database. But you will be able to ask for access to it. And there will be guidance on how to use this and how to use it uh, in the risk assessment process. Um, so it's an early stage now, but over the next three years, I think this, this project will, will sort of be quite exciting and should really help move forward our understanding of pharmaceuticals in the environment. So just to round up then, um, I'd like to thank um, people who have sort of done most of this work, so it's a mixture of postdocs, PhD students, and collaborators. We've had funding from a range of organizations, most of them shown on this graph. Um, and just to very quickly sort of say that if you're ever in York, you're very welcome to visit. Uh, we're now in a, a new department uh, in the university, so this is our new building. Uh, so yeah, if you want to come and spend a few, few weeks in York doing some work on pharmaceuticals in the environment, then drop me an email. Uh, and hopefully we can begin to develop some collaboration. And just to try and attract you to York, these are some pictures of the city. Uh, if you don't know York, it's probably, I think it's the nicest city in the UK. Um, it's a very old city. Uh, it has Roman history, so we have a Roman wall around the city, and we also have the biggest cathedral in Northern Europe. So this is York Minster here, uh, which is a, a beautiful cathedral. Uh, and then this is the River Ouse, where we see all that metformin. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Alistair. That was a very uh, enlightening talk and lots of good information about all the research going on. So we'll take some questions now from the audience, um, and I'll start with one, though. So the PyroPure systems, uh, is that a European country? And do you know approximately how much would a unit, like you showed, cost? Yeah, so uh, PyroPure is a UK company. So they're a, they're a startup company. Uh, at the moment, they're, they're in the product development stage. So there's, the, the product's not quite on the market yet. But I think the indication that I've had is that the cost of the machine would be low tens of thousands uh, in terms of cost. Uh, and they have done the economic analysis, and they think it will be, it'll be a 70% cost saving over a certain period of time compared to what's done at the moment. So economically, it will make sense. What they're doing is, the, the machine that I've showed you um, is, is the, the earlier version. Over the past year, they've been uh, working on further developing it. So I think they're increasing the capacity. And they're also working on, I think they've had problems with certain waste types. So they've been working on how to deal with that. 
I, I think they're almost at the stage now where they're going to have the next uh, machine. Um, but I think uh, they're very interested in beginning to roll it out in the US. So they see this as quite a big market. Mm -hmm. No, it looks very interesting. Are there questions here? For the pyro pier, how much effluent is created per kilogram of waste? Per kilogram. Um, so we we put in, I think it's about 10 kilograms, and I think we had about 300 liters of effluent uh, per per run. It does vary, so it's not a it's not a constant number, but I think that's roughly about the volume of effluent. What's the TOC of that stuff? Do you know? Um, we didn't do the TOC analysis, but you do see the the organic char. So it's probably, um, I would imagine, just looking at it, it's probably a few percent. Other questions here? Look, I'm also interested in the pyro cure, but I will. I'll send you an email later. Yeah. Um, but just overall, um, you know, the problem of the burden of uh, drugs on the environment. What portion of that comes from the? Unused drugs yeah. uh, for, for which you might be interested in the pyro cure device, yeah. and what fraction comes from uh, you know, proper use and excretion through the sanitary system? Yeah, I, th I think that and that's, that's that's actually quite a complex one to answer uh, because I think it varies depending on the active ingredient. So if you look at the literature, um, the literature suggests that depending on the active ingredient, there can be anywhere between three percent and about 65% of the drug that's not used. And that depends on the active ingredient. Um, we've also done surveys We've look, looking at where um, that unused drug goes. Um, so in the UK, actually, most people, um, I think you know, most people put it into the trash. So it'll probably end up in the landfill. Um, I, I, I said probably 10, 20% put it into uh, the sink or the toilets. Um, about 20% take it back to the pharmacists, and not many take it back to the pharmacists, and a few carry on and use them, even though they're well past the sell-by date. Um, so in terms of what goes down the drain, it's probably quite a low percentage overall, um, even for some of the, the high-use ones. But then the landfill uh, site is quite interesting, because we've been starting to look at some of our local landfill sites, and the effluent from that landfill site uh, then goes to the wastewater treatment works. So even when stuff's going in the trash, there's a potential that actually it is getting out into the environment, and that's something we're looking at. So I think PyroPure isn't going to be the, the solution. I think it's part of the solution, and probably what we need is like a combination of these things. Um, and I think you know every little bit we can do you know, could could sort of actually just sort of result in, in broader benefits to the environment. So so it, yeah. So I'd say it's quite a complex question. It's very very situation specific, I think. Martin Page, Army Corps of Engineers, enjoyed your talk. Uh, are there any compounds where a consumption risk model might not be uh, appropriate, or are you considering like showering exposure, potential volatility? So yeah, so so the compounds we focused on are um, pharmaceutical use. So we we haven't um, we don't we don't work on well, we do work on personal care products, but I've not talked about any of the personal care products here. Um, so uh, most of them would be, you know, taken orally, um, and we do have, you know, we do have sort of quite good usage data uh, on those molecules. Now, I, I didn't go into the details on the modelling, but what we have been doing is we have been sort of looking at the modelling uh, to work out, you know, whether what we see in the catchments we're modelling, monitoring, sorry whether that actually makes sense in terms of the, um, the sort of usage data and the metabolism data. And what we've actually used in our spatial modeling is something called inverse modeling, where we sort of calibrate the models, and then we roll the models out across the, the broader catchments. So if you're interested in finding out about exactly how we did the modeling, I can send you the paper, and that'll take you through the step-by-step -step stuff. Um, I, I, I sort of glossed over it in the talk, because it would probably t we've probably been here for another hour if I talked about that. So the fact that a lot of these drugs are passing through us unabsorbed suggests maybe we're dosing ourselves too high. Is the yeah. medical community in the UK involved in reassessing you know, dosing recommendations? Yeah, so I think there's, 
I think everywhere now there's there's an interest in you know more personalised medicine, uh, and I think again that that could be you know, one of, one of the approaches we could use as part of this overall management framework. So if we, if we use more personalised medicine, where we you know, we look at the genetics of an individual and then we we treat based on their their likely susceptibility to, to the drug, um, then that's probably going to result in environmental benefits. Because at the moment we just give everyone you know a set dose um, based on you know sort of uh, so to, to protect everyone, and we probably don't need to do that. Uh, the other thing that I think is quite interesting is people are starting now to think about nanomedicines uh, to improve delivery. Um, so if you look at the literature, uh, quite a lot of the literature is raising concerns about nanomedicines in terms of the environment, but actually it could be a benefit because, we, again, it could be a way of reducing the amount of drug that we give to an individual, so you're increasing what actually gets into the into, into the body and, and the efficacy, so you don't need to use as much. So I think you know, those types of approaches probably will result in benefits. Um, I have a question about the kind of the, the toxicity mass balance. Yeah. So even if you look at 600 or 300 of the drugs that you've talked about, is there any measurement that you have that looks at the total toxicity, whatever metric you want to look at, of the wastewater, yeah. and then try to calculate out what level of toxicity these drugs are actually yeah. inducing? So this is something we're just starting to think about. So we, we've just got a paper um, that's been submitted looking at a com combination or risks of combinations of antibiotics, uh, where we've used mixture models to, to estimate the toxicity of the mixtures, and then we use the exposure models to get an idea of the risk. Um, so we've, we've done that. Now we're also beginning to look at um, potential synergistic interactions in some of these things. And the way we're approaching it is we're looking at molecules that we know are synergistic in us, so they're contraindicated. We're looking at levels in the environment, and we're looking at the levels that get into organisms in the environment, and we're sort of looking at whether, you know, whether they, they can get the, sort of the concentrations where they would cause an, a, a, an interaction in us, whether that could occur in the environment. And then we're going to do experiments to see whether we actually see that or not. Um, if we can do that, then I think we can have a, you know, sort of a quite a neat way of identifying the combination risks. So we are working on it. Um, so three years' time, hopefully, I'll have a better answer. But the the antibiotic stuff, what we're finding is the the lab studies we're doing on the mixtures, we're finding that a concentration addition model actually works quite well in terms of toxicity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, are there other questions here? Okay, um, well thank you uh, everyone for attending today and thank you very much Dr. Boxall for your talk oh, and for coming you. to visit us here. Thank you.